First, I'd like to call out Mike Wagner here as a graduate of our program, uh, uh, our doctoral program. Bill Beebs. <laughs> <laughs> and now working with uh, Coa Pharmaceuticals, and we're very uh, grateful to his support for making this presentation happen. And also, um, I knew Paul first personally before I knew him professionally. We came to know each other during a decade of the 70s. Um, and many of you have not seen, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, and we both use the same term when speaking about the uh, road running in, in New England in the 70s, that it really was a hotbed of, of road races. And, and so that's how we came to know each other. They have wonderful races like the Boston Marathon and another classic one I, I remember, and actually meeting him and his family in a New Hampshire stream before the Mount Washington road race where you would race up to the top of Mount Washington. There. There's only one hill. <laughs> <laughs> the Falmouth road races. But anyway, we would race together. And then I came to know him professionally as he became a leader in the American College of Sports Medicine. He's the past president. But he was always very generous with his time. So annually when we'd be at ACSM, I would track him down and it would be a nice catch up. And in addition to being uh, past president of ACS, American College of Sportsman, I didn't know if I said that fully, but uh, he's also editor of, um, uh, of probably, uh, I'll have to check it here, <laughs> <laughs> Exercise and Sports Cardiology. He is the chief of cardiology emeritus at the Hartford Hospital and also chief of the athletic heart program, or the athlete's heart. He has published over 400 papers has really had great impact uh, personally, professionally, uh, medically, and so we're really excited that he's here today, share his wisdom, and uh, he's the one who has stories to tell today. So welcome, Paul. Well, thanks. I'm so happy to have you here. I'll tell, you this, I'll, start, I'll tell you how I know Tony, and well, I'll never forgive him in just a minute. Uh, but uh, So this is provocative, and it's called, it's called Can the Heart uh, Get a Sports Injury? And as it says up there, at least I guess it went by, um, it uh, should have said that uh, I was the Chief of Cardiology Emeritus at Hartford Hospital, which means I work 80% of the time. So let's start with a story, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here, and that is that nobody knew who Nike was in 1972. Um, and uh, some of you, this advances for me if I'm doing this right. Let's do it this way. So uh, everybody knows that Phil Knight was really a marketing genius. And so what he decided is that at the 1972 Olympic trials, if you qualified for the Olympic trials and you, and you go down to Eugene, Oregon, because the trials were in Eugene in 1972, if you went down to the Nike store, they would give you a set of shoes, a pair of shoes, and they would also give you a t-shirt, an orange t-shirt to match the boxes, and Phil Knight and his wife Penny actually stenciled your name on the back of those t-shirts. So I was a third year medical student and I decided I would try to make the 72 um, trials. But and what I did is I ran to and from all the hospitals that I was training. So I'd run in, I would run home, no matter what time it was over. And my wife was very helpful in training because I would call her at 11 at night after getting off my surgical rotation. I'd say, Camilla, please pick me up. And she said, I will not. It was your idea for me to live six miles from the hospital, because it was six miles to the hospital. So she never picked me up. But then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this whole story forward almost 50 years to this last April. And so I, I um, no longer run the Boston Marathon because I broke my hip in a bike accident. So that was in uh, tw uh, 2012. But I was working the Boston Marathon medical tent, and one of the vice presidents from Nike wanted to talk to me about one of his cardiac conditions. So I talked to him, and at the end he said, well, what shoes do you wear? And I said, yeah, I've worn Nike ever since you gave them to us in 1972. And he said, well, do you have the shirt? And I said, well, of course I have the shirt. I was a third year medical student. I was never going to make it back. I was about to be an intern and a resident. And he said, can you send me a picture of the shirt? So from the floor of our kitchen, these are, oops, these are the kitchen tiles, um, and my shirt with my name on the back. So one of the things I did when I came out here, and Mike enough was nice enough to bring me, is I went to Nike on Wednesday to see if we could negotiate the exchange of the shirt because they couldn't find them. It's not some of the best cotton because Nike had no money at that point. 
But it turned out that it, they only wanted it for the archives. They weren't going to display it. And it, quite frankly, means more to me than it does to Nike, so we kept the shirt. But that's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, so I want you to know that I have a real long background in um, exercise. And I want you to know that I came here not to bury exercise, but to praise it. Now, for some reason, this skipped forward. And so I need to go back. And I need to go back because one of the best stories is back here. And I also need to give my conflicts of interest. So these are my conflicts of interest. If someone makes a cholesterol-lowering drug because of my interest in how exercise affects cholesterol metabolism, and that's where a lot of our NIH work was you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so if they make a, a lipid-lowering agent. And then the other conflict I have is that I'm the, uh, the, uh, the editor of this book, uh, Exercise and Sports Cardiology. It's a three-volume textbook. Uh, 40 chapters. Every one of you should order one immediately after. <laughs> so that's another conflict of interest. And then I'm going to show you one other conflict of interest. And then that is, this is me um, in uh, 1976. And the point about this, and it was, it was Boston Marathon. I didn't, uh, not a very good time. It was 2.29 and I was 16th. But the thing to remember is that there was only one person that passed me in the last 10 miles. And he happens to be sitting right here at Stony Wilcox. <laughs> and I never, ever will forgive him. So if he asks a question at the end and I seem a little rude to him, it's because I've never gotten over it. So how many of you would accept the 229 marathon? Yeah. Well, it's not very good, right? Oh, yeah, I should tell you it was 104 yeah. degrees at the yeah. start. Yeah. It's called the run for the hoses because it was so hot. Um, and the reason I did well is that I remember I ran to Natick um, very easily because I was so hot. And then at Natick, I said, you know what, I think I want to try to catch people. So no one went by me in the last 16 miles, except Tony. Um, so I came here not to, uh, boy, this is, all right, but to praise it. And I didn't make that up, as you know. Um, but I want to talk to you about the fact that there may be a problem and that we're only beginning to understand it. And so I want to talk about that. And I know it won't be a popular topic with some of you, but I think it's always good in science to look at things as hard as you can. So here are the three take-home messages. The first thing is that you get a lot of benefit from little exercise. So this is a review that we did um, called Exercise at the Extremes. Well, um, called Exercise at the Extremes. It's written in combination with Thijs Eisvogels, who's from the Netherlands and spent two years with me on a European fellowship. But what you see here is that when you go from doing no exercise to even a little bit, you get the biggest reduction in cardiovascular risk. But as you get farther out, you get very little reduction and maybe almost no reduction at your higher levels of physical activity. And so um, data uh, based on epidemiologic studies, the, all this data is based on epidemiologic studies because there seems to be skipping Science. Okay. Um, th this data is based on epidemiologic studies because there are really no randomized controlled clinical trials. And so a lot of this effect could be what I've referred to as the hardiness co-founder. And the hardiness co-founder is just that hardier people um, might exercise more and they live longer. And they live longer not solely because of the fact that they exercise, but they live longer because they're hardier and they're uh, healthier in general. So they live longer. They exercise more. They're almost selected to be more physically active. But regardless, these have been used to make the physical activity guidelines for Americans, which were presented just in November 2018 at the American Heart Association, and simultaneously published in JAMA. And I wrote the editorial that went along with them. But the overall message was move more, sit less. And you should do 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate aerobic exercise. So that's you know, something like brisk walking, or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic exercise. And you should also do some resistance exercise training, probably two times a week. And you're all aware of that because you're in an exercise science department, but cardiologists and what are usually are not. Now, you know, that's not a whole lot of exercise. You know that. It's 22 minutes of moderate, 10 minutes of vigorous exercise per day. Um, but you know, the interesting thing is that we don't have much data on these people way out here, these people that do a lot of exercise. We know these are, there are these reductions when you go from very little to some, but then what happens out here? And the other thing we don't have a lot of experience from is we don't have a lot of experience from people in my age group who have exercised all their lives. Because, you know, the jogging epidemic 
started in somewhere in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, with Bowerman and all those folks and Ken Cooper aerobics. So we really don't have a lot of data out here. So maybe there's an opportunity to learn things that we don't know about. Also, there are no clinical trials documenting the benefits of exercise. That's what everybody says, and I do too. But the question is, or are there? And I'm going to maintain to you that there are, because there are things like this, exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation. This is analysis of 47 trials that included mortality, a lot of patients. They were assigned to either cardiac rehab versus no cardiac rehab. This was published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. But there was a 26 reduction in cardiac deaths. And cardiac deaths is a great thing to measure, much better than measuring myocardial infarctions, much better than measuring things like angina Y because it's hate, it's very hard to fake death. You know, you're either there or you're not. So as you can see, there's this 26% reduction. And you know that there are um, lots of supportive data for this in terms of the effects of exercise on cardiac risk factors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's reasonable to accept that even though we'll never, probably never, have a randomized controlled clinical trial, that there's good evidence that you get a lot of benefit from going from very little to more. And that's really, for the public healthies here, that's really the public health message. Now, there are acute exercise effects. And we won't spend a lot of time on this, because if you don't know it, I don't know where you've been. But here's one of our studies from way back in 1982. So I, when I left Stanford, where I did my cardiology training, when I left Stan, um, Stanford, I went to Brown. And it took me about a month to figure out that there was one medical examiner, this guy, Bill Sterner. And he was very interested in doing research. So I convinced him to collect everybody that dropped dead jogging over a six-year period. So now we had, because if you die suddenly, you're a medical examiner's case. So now we had all the bodies. So how do you go to find how many joggers there are? So what we did is we did a random digit telephone survey. I had this computer which generated Rhode Island area telephone numbers and these three women who spoke all the common Rhode Island languages and they would call people up between five and seven at night. Now you want to know what the common Rhode Island languages are. English, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and profane. <laughs> and that's because a lot of people don't like to be called between 5 and 7 in the evening. So these tapes can't be released. But what we found is something, something very straightforward. And that is when you look at deaths per activity hour, you're seven times more likely to die during exercise, jogging, than you are at rest. You all know that. Now, the death uh, per number of joggers was quite low. Overall, there was one death per 7,620 men. Half of them had known heart disease. So among healthy people, there's only one death for about every 15,000 joggers per year. It's very low, but it's higher than the deaths sitting here listening to this lecture, at least I hope, okay? <laughs> but you get the point. The death rate goes up during that physical activity. And this is a study of male joggers. Uh, wh why is it a study of male joggers? Because it's very hard to find women who die during exercise. In fact, women are protected from sudden death in general. And they, you know, they're not protected from myocardial infarctions, et cetera, et cetera. And as they get older, they're not protected. But, but women are in general protected from sudden cardiac death. And the mechanism's not really clear. Maury Middleman had this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993. And what is this? This is the risk of not dying but having a myocardial infarction. So here's the overall risk of one. Here are the dudes and here the folks that don't uh, do much exercise. They do no exercise. And this is their death rate when they go chasing the grandkid. Or they change the tire. Or they shovel the snow because physical activity happens. And you can see on a logarithmic scale how high the risk is for someone who gets no exercise. But even over here with someone who does a lot of exercise, that person is still more likely to have their event during exercise and at rest. Um, we think it has a lot to do with this process. So here's a coronary artery. And this is a coronary artery that there's a catheter here and they're injecting the coronary artery and it looks totally normal. But here's an intravascular ultrasound catheter. Here's a catheter in the coronary artery taking ultrasonic pictures. And what does it show? It shows you that that artery has remodels and there's this great lump of cholesterol. It's thin here, it's thin here, it's thick here. And when you look at that pathologically, it looks like this. So here's the lumen, 
Here's the cholesterol deposit. And as you deposit cholesterol, the artery remodels. The artery expands to take the cholesterol. So you can have an injection into the coronary artery that looks totally normal, but there's a chunk of cholesterol in the artery. Now look, this is thick. This fibrous cap is thick. It's unlikely to rupture. This fibrous cap is very thin. So here you are exercising, right? Here's your heart. Here are your crowning or coronary arteries. They sit on top. They're along for the ride. As the heart beats faster, they, they have to bend more frequently. And if you deposit atherosclerosis, this is stiff. This part of the artery is stiff. This part of the artery is flexible. So it's almost like you take a rubber hose that's been left out in the sun and you bend it back and forth. What do you get? You get a crack. You get a crack in the, in the, in the hose, right? Well, you can also get a crack in the cholesterol plaque and then the blood mixes with all this stuff, and this stuff has a lot of tissue factor which produces clots. So you go from having an open lumen to a closed lumen, and here's a study we did on three men. Uh, with the, I did this with the folks at, Tuff, at Tufts. These are three men, I think I have a better slide here, three men who had heart attacks during the 2011 Boston Marathon, and what do you see? You see a clot here, and then when it's opened up by angioplasty, that's what it looks like, and there's the clot. Here's a person who, turned, who blocked off the left anterior descending here. And here it is after the folks, they had a busy afternoon that day after they opened it with uh, angioplasty. And here's a blockage of the circumflex coronary artery, and here's the circumflex coronary artery open. So at least some of these deaths are due to acute plaque rupture, blood clot, a coronary thrombosis, and a heart attack. But some of the ruptures are also due just to the fact that over time, these folks have developed atherosclerosis. So here's a study looking at sudden cardiac death during sports participation in middle age. At my age, we never ask what they're talking about there with middle age. But anyway, here are sports-related events, and here are non-sports-related events. Here are the acute coronary events. Here's the crack in the plaque. Here's the crack in the plaque. Not a lot of difference between sports and non-sports. But the important thing is this. A lot of these events are not acute. They're a narrowed artery. When the person exercises, the myocardium does not get enough blood. It gets ischemic, and they get ventricular fibrillation or cardiac arrest from that. The key point, uh, it's not all plaque rupture. So, um, you know, the idea that exercises produces acute cardiac events is very old. It's very old news. My study was published in January 1982. Everybody knows that, but I'm just springing it up for completion. What I'd like to go on, though, is I'd like to talk about the fact that there may be cardiac consequences from too much exercise. So, a study done by Arthur Siegel and published in the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine way back in 1980. And what they looked at is they looked at CK, or creatine kinase elevations, in marathon runners in relationship training and competition. And they found that if they looked at 15 doctors who ran the Boston Marathon in 1979, their CKs went up remarkably high. And as Tony and I can tell you, Boston is especially hard in terms of raising CKs because it's a downhill race. Here are in Hopkinton, you run all the way down to Newton Lower Falls, you run up the Newton Hills, and then you run down again. Overall, you lose 440 feet or so, but you do it almost twice. And as exercise people, you know that eccentric exercise, when the muscle is contracting and being stretched simultaneously, produces the most injury. So even though you get these gigantic CK increases at Boston, um, of CK, sign of muscle injury, but it wasn't just the um, uh, the it wasn't just CK total that was elevated. It was also CK MB, and MB stands for myocardial band. So there was concern way back in the early 80s. Could you actually be hurting the heart during exercise? But Siegel went on, and what they did is they biopsied the lateral gastrox in 25 marathon runners in 10 controls, and they found a very interesting thing. They found that the skeletal muscle had more CKMB activity than normal. Look at that. The skeletal muscle has almost double the CKMB. 
And they noted that fetal muscle has a lot of CKMB. The embryo has a lot of uh, CKMB. And so they speculated that those increased levels in the runners may be repairing damaged cells. Another study, they looked at repair in these uh, runners, and they found that there were a lot of satellite cells. And as you probably know, although I won't assume it, satellite cells are those pluripotential cells that repair injured skeletal muscle. So what's the explanation? Runners constantly injuring skeletal muscle, uh, which is repaired using satellite cells. Uh, they're pluripotential. They can make so-called cardiac enzymes. And these injured satellite cells release CKMB after the race. Heart's not involved. Case dismissed. It's all skeletal muscle. Okay? And then along comes Rob Shave and a bunch of his friends who looked at cardiac troponin T. Now, cardiac troponin T is much more specific for the heart. It's not the most specific, but it's pretty specific. Clearly better than CKMB. Here's a normal level. So if you've got if you get above 0.05, you worry that the heart is being hurt. And they found, looking at 72 runners in the London Marathon, that nearly half of them had big elevations in cardiac troponin T. I told you, I always tell the interns and residents of the cardiology fellows that T stands for trouble, right? Because it's not as specific. So what about cardiac troponin I, which is very specific for the cardiac muscle? So here's one of our studies looking at 71 runners in the Boston Marathon. Every single one of our subjects increased their cardiac troponin I. So it suggests that every single one of those runners might have done something to their heart. Okay, I still was not totally willing to believe it um, in truth. But then here's a study from 2018, and they're looking at cardiac troponin T and cardiac troponin I in patients with various skeletal muscle disorders. So dystrophic myopathy, myotonia, um, neurogenic muscle disease, myotonic dystrophy, et cetera. You can see that. And if you look at cardiac troponin T, with normal being here, you can see that a lot of them have an increase in cardiac troponin trouble. So maybe that is from skeletal muscle. But if you look at those, if you look at the elevation in cardiac troponin I, very few of them have elevation, making you concerned that the elevation in cardiac troponin I with these folks running the Boston Marathon is actually from the heart. So the troponin T I increase with prolonged exercise is probably from the heart. But does it mean anything? Maybe it doesn't mean anything. So what we did is with some of my friends in the Netherlands, uh, with that fellow Thijs Eisvogels who spent two years with me, we looked at exercise-induced cardiac troponins and what happened to people, their deaths and their cardiovascular events. Um, and this is the group. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm third author primarily because it was something I suggested to them that we should do. And this was published in circulation just in August. So this is what it looks like. We looked at cardiac troponin I in 725 walkers. Now, they were not young dudes and du dudettes. They were middle-aged dudes and dudettes. Um, so they were walking what's called the Nijmegen marches. And the Nijmegen marches are in memory of those individuals who parachuted into um, the Netherlands and drowned during the Second World War, uh, you know, a lot of Americans, et cetera. And they measured these, about, we measured cardiac troponin I before and after these walks of 30 to 55 kilometers. Um, we looked at cardiac troponin I greater than the 99th percentile, so really out there, the people that really put their cardiac troponin I high. And we subsequently looked at all-cause mortality in cardiovascular events. The average follow-up was over three years, it was almost four years. And what we found was quite remarkable. Here are the folks that have cardiac troponin eyes that remained not very elevated, and this is their survival from a cardiovascular event. And here are the folks that increased their cardiac troponin I. And you can see that, their, that those folks who increased their cardiac troponin I, it wasn't a benign thing. If they increased their cardiac troponin I during these long walks, now it's a walk, it's not a marathon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all disclaimers. But for the first time, it actually raises questions whether raising those cardiac troponin eyes, or raising troponin I, 
I mean, I still have a little trouble totally buying it all. But raising troponin I, which probably comes from the heart, has a bad prognosis. And what do you get? You get cardiovascular events. So is this increase in cardiac troponin I from a SCULT a ischemic disease? Do they have narrowing of the coronary arteries that we don't know? And so when they exercise, they're not getting enough blood to their myocardium, and the myocardium releases small amounts of cardiac troponin. Or is it actually due to myocardial injury? Does prolonged exercise hurt the heart? And that's the next thing I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about how prolonged endurance exercise actually puts a load on the heart. Um, and the question is, can the heart get a sports injury? injury? Here's a paper from 1990 uh, by Pam Douglas, who I've known all that time. And Pam Douglas was at the uh, Beth Israel in Boston at the time she did the study, but she went on to be the chief of cardiology at Duke. And what Pam did is she did echocardiograms on people participating in the Kona triathlon. In, uh, uh, and she measured their heart size and function before and after the race. And I hope you can see this, but it says that, I'll read it for you. After exercise, the left ventricle, the left and right atrium both got smaller. Their size was reduced. But the right ventricle size increased. The right ventricle size got bigger. And you know, when the heart's not doing well uh, with acutely, it gets bigger. Because if you're weak, if my hand is strong, and I want a cup of water out of my uh, water bottle, now, I never buy water bottles, right? Because I think it's foolish, right? So out of my steel <laughs> water bottle, you know, really. The, who can believe that we buy water in plastic <laughs> bottles? I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to get going. OK. So if I, my hand is strong, I can squeeze down on that Poland Springs water bottle. And you know, Poland Springs water is actually taken from the Poland Springs municipal supply. They take out the fluoride so you can get to, sorry. <laughs> um, so if my hand is strong, I can squeeze it down. But if my hand is weak, it helps to have a bigger water bottle. So I only have to go like that, right? And I can still get out a cup of water. So anything that stresses the heart makes it tend to get bigger. Here's a study from Andrew LaGersh, who's been one of the leaders about it. And what he did is he looked at 40 athletes before and one week after races of 3 to 11 hours duration, mountain biking, running, long races. And he found that the right ventricular volume increased, the left ventricular volume decreased, and that changes in brain natriuretic peptide, which is a hormone released from the heart under stress, and cardiac troponin I correlated with the decrease in right ventricular ejection fraction. The right ventricular ejection fraction decreased with the event duration, the longer they're out there, and also with the individual VO2 max. The better you are, the more your right ventricle went down. What? The better I am, the more my right ventricle gets hurt? Multiple studies show that the right ventricle seems to be most vulnerable. So why? Why the right ventricle? Because the right ventricular wall stress is lower at rest because your pulmonary artery pressure is lower. Your pulmonary artery pressure in absolute numbers is lower than your systolic blood pressure. There is an increase in pulmonary artery pressure, and it's relatively greater than the increase in systemic blood pressure. Pulmonary artery pressure can go up threefold. It's very unusual to get somebody who goes from 120 to 360 because the vascular resistance decreases only 30 to 50 percent of the lungs. The lungs can't vasodilate like your thigh and gastrocnemius versus about a 75 percent reduction in the systemic circulation. So there's greater increase in wall stress, and LaGersh and Heimdachl have estimated it's 125 percent increase in wall stress in the pulmonary circulation versus only 24 percent systemically. And remember, it's imposed on the thin right ventricular wall. Now, if I, as a cardiologist, want to see if the heart has a scar, what do I do? I do something called a cardiac MR with late gadolinium. So what you do is you inject the pay, you, in, you take a picture of the heart, then you inject gadolinium, and the gadolinium will show up if there's scar. And why does it show up? Because if the muscle is like this, it's very hard, and this is the way skeletal muscle is, right, or the cardiac muscle is, all the fibers are overlapped. You can't get anything in between them very easily. But if you've got scar, the fibrils are at different angles. So the gadolinium can get in there, and it can stay. 
So we use that to see if there's scar in the heart. Gadolinium enters, sorry, gadolinium, gadolinium enters myocardial areas of fibrosis because filament structure allows its retention, so it's a marker of myocardial scarring and fibrosis. So let's go back to Ligertia's study. They looked at late gadolinium enhancement, and they found that remarkably, five of 39 individuals in the longest exercises, those people who had exercised the longest period during their life, had late gadolinium enhancement. They had evidence of scar. Well, where is it? The scar tended to be this is normal, so here's a normal intraventricular septum. Here's one of the athletes. They had scar in the intraventricular septum, primarily at these hinge points where the left ventricle meets the right ventricle. Now, there's some scarring there in the intraventricular septum, but often it's at the hinge sites, the hinge sites, the hinge sites, the hinge sites, and this one has it throughout. But it's at the point where this right ventricle, which is enlarging during exercise, meets the interventricular septum, areas where you could suspect there would be increased stress. Now, this stuff about affecting the right ventricle has clinical importance to me as a cardiologist who sees people with heart disease. Um, this has consequences in individuals for the genes for something called right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It's also known as arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So in order for the myocardium to function, the, the, the fibrils have to be attached to each other. And they're attached by these plates called the desmosomes. Um, the desmosomes provide mechanical connection between the myocytes. There are genetic defects in those desmosomes which cause arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Why arrhythmogenic? because these kids are, are predisposed to ventricular fibrillation. They're predisposed to sudden death. The penetrance is very variable. You can have the same genes and one kid's sick and his brother's fine. So why is that due to environmental factors? So what Hugh Hawkins and his friends at um, Johns Hopkins did, and Hugh wrote the chapter for my book that you're all about to buy. So um, he queried 87 desmosomal carriers about their exercise, asked them how much exercise they did. And then what he tried to see is if those people that did more exercise had more evidence of right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And this is the paper, October 2013. And I think it is a concept-breaking paper because it showed for the first time, to my knowledge, that there's a group of people who shouldn't exercise. And what he showed is that if you looked at the exercise in the hours per year prior to the presentation, the more exercise you got, the more likely you were to present with full-blown right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And look over here. Here are the athletes and the non-athletes. And if you were an athlete, you were much more likely to present um, with uh, full-blown right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Also, if you look at survival and heart failure for the athletes and non-athletes, so every, and there, there's, there's 10 of these pictures in that paper. In every time, the athletes in green, in green, did worse. Um, now, the crazy thing is, is that Andrew Gersh thinks that there may be people athletes who can produce right ventricular cardiomyopathy without the genes, that they can do so much stress on their right ventricle that they get trouble. And here's the paper. And what they found is they found a bunch of athletes who had all the criteria of right ventricular cardiomyopathy but no genes. And who were they? They were athletes who were cyclists and triathletes. Now, why do I think it's cyclists and triathletes? If you're a runner, like Tony and I were, and we, you know, my wife says the older I am, the faster I was. <laughs> right? Because I, I kind of make up the data now. But if you're, an, if you're a runner, it's very hard to run more than two hours a day. You can't do it. You just get too beaten up. But if you're a cyclist, you routinely ride five hours a day. And if you're a triathlete, you can swim and you can run. So you can do a lot of exercise demanding a lot of work out of that right ventricle. 
So, I mean, it's an interesting theory. Now, why, why right ventricular ejection fraction decrease with event duration in individual to VO2 max? Why does this happen to the best athletes? These guys that Le, Le Gersh found that have these right ventricular cardiomyopathies, they were good. They weren't slugs. They were good competitors. Why in good athletes? You know that oxygen uptake equals the AVO2 difference times the cardiac output. And the cardiac output is due to heart rate and stroke volume. Now, you guys don't need this, but when I lecture to cardiologists, they need it. <laughs> so exercise capacity is a surrogate for stroke volume. If you're a good athlete, you've got a good stroke volume. If you've got good performance, you've got a good, sure, you could have a special heart rate. Sure, you could have a bigger AVO2 difference, but it doesn't happen that often. Good stroke volumes, good athlete. Meaning that good athletes have to have bigger right ventricles. Because if you've got a big left ventricular stroke volume, it's got to come from, comes from the right ventricle. Pushed into a resistant vascular bed. So a bigger stroke volume, the bigger your stroke volume, the, the more you're going to strain that right ventricle. And the resistance doesn't improve. When you exercise train, you can reduce peripheral resistance in the systemic circulation. You don't change the, the, the pulmonary vascular resistance. It's just fixed. It's fixed in this cavity. Now, it does improve a little bit, and that's probably due to shunting and other things with training. And this is all well described in British Journal of Sports Medicine by these guys who really, it's not my idea. Okay. So, we're going to take a break, and we're going to move on. I'm going to make you even more depressed. I'm going to ask you the question, can exercise accelerate atherosclerosis? <coughs> what? Exercise reduces cardiovascular events. Can exercise accelerate atherosclerosis? So we have to go all the way back to New England Journal of Medicine, 1961. And this is the autopsy of Clarence DeMar. Now, Clarence DeMar was a printer in Melrose, Mass., who won the Boston Marathon seven times. Um, when he died, Paul Dudley White, sorry, that's Clarence, running, I think, in the 30s, yeah, 1930. And I actually have a copy of his original book. My father was a minister north of Boston, and he had the funeral of one of the Boston sports writers who couldn't afford to pay him for doing the funeral. His wife couldn't afford to pay him for doing the funeral, so he let my dad pick books out of his uh, collection. And yeah, my dad knew that I was interested in distance running, so picked all the runner books, and so I have one. Um, in 1961. And then here's, um, uh, here's the, Paul Dudley White, um, very famous Boston cardiologist, one of the first to use the electrocardiogram in, at Mass General in the United States, and that's Dudley White. And he actually is the only cardiologist I know that's ever had a stamp named after him, which was done in 1986. It's also an interesting story because when he did the autopsy, DeMar had already been embalmed. Now, you can only find that by reading the report because it says stuff like, you know, it was hard to look at the heart because of the trocar holes and, you know, the formaldehyde was... So, but that... And we actually... There's actually a rumor. Paul Dudley White was a bulldog, right? There's actually a rumor that DeMar was buried and Paul Dudley White convinced his wife to dig him up. Now, I tried to verify that by going to a lot of the old cardiologists in Boston and no one could verify it, but that's the rumor. So anyway, this is what they found. They found that when they autopsied Clarence, this is his left main, he had a ton of atherosclerosis. He ran his last marathon two years before he died, and he died of um, colon cancer. So there's the atherosclerosis. Um, and they say in the article um, that uh, this, this is the left main coronary artery showing a fair degree of atherosclerosis of the wall, but a still a good-sized lumen and you can see a lot of atherosclerosis. Oh, let's jump forward. So let's jump forward to um, this guy, and he allows me to discuss his case. This is Ambrose Burfoot, who in 1968 won the Boston Marathon in kind of a pedantic time of 227, uh, 222, but he did go on to run 214 at Fukuoka, so he could, he could motor. He still runs 25 miles per week. Now, when I want to know if you've got some atherosclerosis, one of the things we can do is we can do a coronary artery calcification scan. So it's a special x-ray that shows whether you've got any calcification of the coronary arteries. If you've got no calcification of the coronary arteries, you likely don't have much in the way of atherosclerosis. If you've got a ton of calcification of the coronary arteries, you likely have a ton of calcification. 
Ambro Burfoot. So we like it under 100 or zero. Ambrose Burfoot has a score of 946. Yeah, anecdotal. So here's another study we did with our folks. Here's another study we did with our friends from the Netherlands. We looked at 284 competitive and recreational athletes, and we divided into those that were doing less than 1,000 nets per week uh, over their lifetime, all the way up to um, greater than 2,000. So different degrees of how much exercise they did. And what did we find? We find that those people that were doing the most exercise tended to more frequently have coronary artery calcification scores over 100. The more active people, even adjusting for age, et cetera, et cetera, had more calcification. Um, and they also, yeah. Um, and that if you looked at le lifelong exercise volume and the total amount of atherosclerotic plaques, not just calcified, but the total amount, the more exercise you got uh, did, the more calcification you have. Um, and it tended to be calcified plaque. It tended to be the hard calcified plaque. You can see that this is the people that are the most active, and there's the dominant plaque type, which is calcified. We're not the only people to show this. Um, Sanjay, oh, sorry, it's not up there. Sanjay Sharma's um, group from London has done a similar study, and this is what they showed. They showed that if you look at male athletes versus male controls, the male athletes, in terms of coronary artery calcification score, it's much higher. And this is now a consistent finding in the literature. Those individuals, compared with sedentary folks, have a lot more coronary calcification. Here again is from Sanjay Sharma's group. Here are the controls, here are the male athletes, and it tends to be highly calcified, highly calcified plaque. And you can see it there. Now, more calcium may not be bad. Why? Because if you've got a lot of calcium, you may have a stable plaque, a plaque that when the car twists and turns and stuff, doesn't crack, doesn't give you the crack in the plaque. So this is looked at at this study, um, looking at the density of the coronary artery plaques. If you have a high number, you've got to have a lot of dense plaque. So this is what it looks like. As the plaque goes up, this is heart disease risk, as your plaque goes up, your risk of heart disease goes down. As the density goes up, your risk of heart disease, uh, sorry, goes up. I said it wrong way. As the calcification goes up, the risk of a cardiovascular event goes up. As the density goes up, it goes down. Okay? So this data is not necessarily bothersome because it may mean that these athletes are putting down atherosclerosis, but it's calcified and hard. But I do want to make one last thing, and that is that extreme exercise may actually accelerate all atherosclerosis and not just hard atherosclerosis. So this is um, a study on extreme endurance exercise in progressive coronary disease. This is the race across America. I mean, if you guys are bored for a couple months and you want to run across the country, this is the thing for you. It's a 140-day foot race. You run 26 miles a day, and the lazy buggers take a day off weekly. Um, eight of the 10 folks finished. Um, they had CTA, so um, computer, computerized tomographic coronary angiograms the day before and the day after the race. At baseline, four of them had no coronary artery disease. Four of these finishers had no coronary artery disease. And four had some left anterior descending uh, coronary artery disease on their CTAs. All with coronary disease had more non-calcified coronary artery disease developed at their prior sites. So here's, this, here's, so here's one subject, two subjects, three subjects, four subjects. This person got more soft plaque. This person, more soft plaque. This person got more plaque in general, no change in a soft plaque. This was the only person in the race who took a statin the whole race. And look at this person. That person deposited a ton of soft plaque, the vulnerable, dangerous plaque. Um, there's this study published by Ben Levine, and they have, this has been used by everybody to say that there's no risk for having increased coronary calcification. This is the study that says this, and it always gets cited, and you'll see it cited as saying that there's no risk of this increased calcification. But I want to show you the problem. So this is a terrible slide, and I apologize for it, but these are the folks with coronary artery calcification scores less than 100. 
those with coronary artery calcification scores greater than 100, the different exercise groups, okay, more than 1,000 and all. And this is said that there's no difference because this is not statistically significant. This whole thing down here about the, um, your, um, your incidence of death, it's not different. But let me show you something. This value right here, if you're a big exerciser and you don't have coronary artery calcification, the value is 0.2. The value over here is 1.8. That's ninefold higher. Now, it's not statistically significant. Why isn't it statistically significant? There weren't enough deaths. But that doesn't reassure me. But it gets quoted all the time as, we've shown that this coronary artery calcification is not risky. Baloney. Anything that increases it nine times has got my attention. Well, the p-value is probably 0.06 or something. Well, it's, not, it's I don't know what it is, Michael. It's a good point. But the point is, is it's always presented as that way, and I just want to point it out. Okay, so these folks had more coronary artery calcification than expected. Why? Because exercise causes turbulence, which increases coronary artery disease. Where do you put atherosclerosis? You put atherosclerosis at branch points. You put it in the carotid siphon. You put it in the abdominal aorta where it bifurcates. You put it where the vertebral arteries come off the aorta. You put it in the heart arteries. Why? Why does it happen in the heart arteries so early? Because they twist and turn. They create turbulence. So maybe the exercise increases turbulence. Maybe exercise ruptures these plaques, which heal. Some people think calcification is a sign of healed plaques. Or maybe because exercise increases parathyroid hormone. It does. So here's a study looking at um, the effect of exercise in male cyclists, two hours of exercise, and the parathyroid hormone levels, which has a lot to do with increasing calcium levels, virtually double with the exercise. So we don't know, but I am concerned that there may be in very prodigious exercises, people that do a lot of exercise, that risk. So we've talked about sports injuries, we've talked about atherosclerosis, and then I'm going to talk about atrial fibrillation. Now, what's atrial fibrillation? Sinus rhythm is this. The atrium contracts, the ventricle contracts. Gush, 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 gush. Atrial fibrillation is when the atrium quivers. It just quivers. Now, when it quivers and blood doesn't move, it can cause blood clots. And the biggest risk of atrial fibrillation is blood clots. But you all know that because you watch TV, right? And you see all the advertisements for, I don't want to get a blood clot. Uh, right, okay. Bang back in, 19, in 2009, I tried to get this paper published about atrial fibrillation endurance athletes. And all we did is we looked at the six studies that were in the literature, and every single one of them said that atrial fibrillation was more common in endurance athletes. I could not get this published in any reasonable medical journal because nobody wanted to believe it. And for, so finally we got it published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And then in 2015, because now everybody believes this, um, because a bunch of studies came out, I was asked to write an editorial on it for Jack, and what it looks like is there's a J-shaped curve, meaning this. You've got very little exercise, you've got a lot of AFib, right? And then it goes down. When you get a, a moderate amount of exercise, your AFib risk goes down, but when you get a lot, it goes back up. And I'll summarize that in the next series of studies. So here's someone's baseline fitness and their chance of having AFib. They've all had AFib here. If they're very fit, you're, more, you're less likely to get more AFib. If you're unfit, you're much more likely to get AFib a second time. If you get in shape, if you get in shape, you're less likely to get AFib again, whereas if you don't increase your exercise, you're more likely to get AFib. And then just in August 2019 was published a series of uh, a, a summary study from the Vesa Lopet. So this is a Swedish uh, cross-country race. The Vesa Lopet uh, looked at 2008 Swedish skiers who had participated in the Vesa Lopet um, between 1989 and 2011. Now the Vesa Lopet is a cross-country ski race that goes anywhere from 30 to 90 kilometers. And they used matched non-skiers from the Swedish health registries. And the nice thing about these, um, you know, these um, Nordic countries is they have very good data on outcomes, and so they can do studies like this. And here's what happened. If you're a woman and you were slow or fast, it didn't matter. The, more, um, the, uh, 
the, if you looked at performance time, it didn't seem to affect. In fact, the, the women who were better had lower rates of AFib. But if you were a male and you were good, as you went faster, you were more likely to have AFib. The best athletes, the fastest athletes, you got the theme? The fastest athletes had more AFib. What about stroke risk? So here are the non, here are the skiers with atrial fibrillation. If you compare the non-skiers and the skiers with atrial fibrillation, the non-skiers have more problems, no doubt about it. But if you're a skier with atrial fibrillation, you're still worse off than a skier without atrial fibrillation. So what does it show? It shows that it looks like the skiers get more atrial fibrillation, especially if they're good and it's not benign. So why? Maybe it's increased vagal tone. If you slow the heart down a lot with exercise training, that lets extra beats come in and capture the atrium. So maybe that's it. Maybe it's the sympathetic tone with exertion. Maybe it's increased inflammation, because exercise causes a temporary increase in inflammation. And what we think it is, is atrial enlargement. Why? Because it happens in the best athletes. And to be good, you have to have a good stroke volume. That means you've got to have a big left atrium to fill that big left ventricle, which means you need a big right ventricle to fill the big left atrium. To fill. So here's a study by Antonio Pelliccia looking at left atrial dimensions in 1800 elite Italian athletes. And, uh, uh, Dr. Pelliccia was the cardiologist for the um, the Italian Olympic team. A normal left atrium AP diameter is less than 40. 20% 20 of these athletes were over 40. Really big left atrium is greater than 45. 11% of them had big left atriums. Big left atriums. And you may know that atrial fibrillation is especially prominent among professional basketball players in the NBA. Why? It's been shown for years that the taller you are, the more likely you are to have atrial fibrillation. Why? You're big, you got a big heart. Right? So size matters. So, Houston, do we have a problem? Well, yeah, you know, I really don't think so. <laughs> um, I think endurance athletes routinely live longer. You know, we just had a, a paper in Lancet looking at the survival of the uh, first 20 sub four minute milers, and they all live longer than comparison people in their countries. Um, but is this endowment that they live longer, or is it training? Is it the hardiness factor? Also, there are a few studies that have included athletes at the extreme right end of the curve. We just haven't seen people way out there doing this much exercise. We, I think we do have some interesting clinical observations. Um, they're important clinically, because I see athletes from around the country, and I need to be able to talk to them about their coronary calcification, be able to talk to them about their atrial fibrillation, and put it into perspective. So clinically, I think it's important, and a lot of people don't know about it. I also think it's a great learning research opportunity. In my whole academic career, what it is, I mean, I've always been a clinical cardiologist, not at, like, the major academic medical centers. Hartford Hospital is not a major academic medical center. But I've always used my clinical interest in sports and exercise physiology to find interesting things within medicine that we could do a research in. Um, so if, you know, this is, again, back from exercise at the extremes. But what I want to point out is that when you look at moderate exercise, moderate exercises in the straight lines, there's no suggestion of any increase. This is an increase that's with, with the more vigorous exercise. All the questions are not related to moderate exercise, but they're really related to um, the more vigorous exercise. So what are the three home take-home messages? You get a lot of benefit from relatively little exercise. So the public health message is different than the competitive message. Um, there are acute exercise cardiac events. We all know it. Uh, people drop dead during exercise, and they have myocardial infarctions during exercise. At Hartford Hospital, 10% of our myocardial infarctions happen during physical exertion. You know, people don't spend 10% of their time in physical exertion, so it's an excessive number. And there may be cardiac consequences from too much exercise. It's really a, a thrill to be able to come and talk to you, just to, uh, to try to pick on Tony once again. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me. It's your turn to ask questions and my turn to make up answers, so <laughs> what do you have to say? Please. 
do you work uh, with the Casado at all over at UConn, and what's your theory on the relationship between heat and uh, like hot? So hot does anybody? Does anybody work with Doug Costa? That's like, well, they try to. <laughs> okay, good. So, you know. Um, so, um, you know, uh, there, there, are, there are heat problems. You, you know, so heat pushes an additional stress on the, on the heart, clearly. But, you know, heat is more likely to cause heat stroke. So um, it, it does increase the risk of cardiac events, but it's relatively small compared to the fact that cardiac events are increased by exercise itself. And then, of course, you know, when you compare exercise in the heat versus exercise in the cold, Cold causes coronary artery constriction. You know, putting a person's face in a cold pan uh, causes coronary artery constriction. Putting their hand in a cold pan causes coronary artery constriction. Angina, tightness in the chest, more likely during cold weather. You know, snow shoveling, more dangerous than other activities. So the truth is, environmental factors matter, but heat's not a big player in this issue. Please, sir. Um, one, one comment and one question, if I may. I think there's one, in your early on in your presentation, you said there was no trial evidence of exercise and cardiovascular disease risk reduction. I can think of one from Andrea Kriska's group about 15 years ago. Uh, it was in archives. A randomized control clinical yeah, trial? Yeah, it, it was a, a long term follow up of an earlier successful physical activity modification. So trial. I think I know. It yeah, okay. And it was for the, the events were self reported events, so it, it's, it's softer outcomes. Yeah. Um, so thank you, because I'm unaware of it. Right. Um, because I, I'm, I'm not sure. But, if I, you, but know Andrew quite well, so right. I can look it up. Because I'm not, I'm not sure you can necessarily um, extend evidence from trials of people with existing heart positions, conditions to the general population. But uh, so there's, there's one question there. So let me just address yeah. that. That's fair. But uh, just in terms of whether there's any evidence of benefit, I think there is evidence of benefit in that, in that group. So. In the in group of patients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, one of the other things, I'll be honest with you, one of the other things that's always concerned me about using that data is that cardiac rehab programs have nurses around to resuscitate you if you have a cardiac arrest. Right. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is go back through those and see how many cardiac arrests were saved and whether the data comes out to show as good a mortality benefit. Or identify things early on. Yeah, or identify things early on. And then the question was, um, could you expand a little bit on what you think the application is of much of the work here on elite or very um, distinguished athletes to the general population, to public health? So, um, a little harder for me to do that. Um, so, you want me to... These are not necessarily elite athletes. In other words, some, a lot of them are, but they're not necessarily elite athletes. But, I mean, you know, it raises, we, you know, we've always used exercise in like our studies on endurance athletes and marathons and stuff like that, because it's easier to identify the principles when there's a big bang, the big bang theory of research to a big effect. So we don't know how much this, uh, this affects um, people who, who are not elite, don't have big ventricles, don't get big hearts, et cetera. So we don't really know. I don't really know. Yeah, I just wonder, because, I mean, most of the population are woefully inactive. Well, look, so. our problem is not this. Our problem is not people who are getting too much exercise. Yeah. That's not the public health problem. This, I, I realize it's a public health group. Our problem is people who don't get enough, much exercise. You know, this is something I'm interested in. You know, I get invited, I talk what I'm interested in. <laughs> Please. I want to get a little bit of a clearer understanding on your perspective on uh, exercise modality and heart damage. Um, you presented information at the beginning about the runners talking about cardiac component. Yes. And its relationship, well, kind of the broad relationship that increased cardiac component is related to increased cardiac damage. Um, and you also showed some information with cyclists and triathletes yes. um, showing that increased right, particular cardiomyopathy in those individuals. I pulled up a review um, or a, a meta-analysis on uh, cardiac troponin, and it looks like uh, cyclists and triathletes actually show lower cardiac troponin during exercise. So kind of what, I just kind of think it all kind of from your So is that Shave's review? Yes. Yes, okay. So if you look at Shave's review, which I edited for him, okay. is that um, a lot of that is troponin T. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to be, they got, and that actually was one of the studies that supported my bias that it was from skeletal muscle. 
because the heavier people had more cardiac component T stuff. These new, in, in cardiology, there's been this amazing uh, progression of the quality of the tests. And cardiac troponin I is pretty darn specific for the heart, we think. So in terms of speculating on the effect of various exercise modalities, I can't really very well, because most of the stuff has been done with running. Um, Andrew LaGersh's study on the, uh, the late gadolinium enhancement and all that did have people that were doing long mountain bike races and, and, and triathlons and stuff like that. But I can't give you a lot of data on that. So we really need to know whether you, know, you get car cardiac troponin I elevations from other events and stuff like that. It's perfectly based on position, too, right? Now with running, you're vertical and expect greater blood pressures and perhaps, perhaps you can see Greater instance of heart injury versus something where you're on a bike and you know, somewhat reclining, would that affect? I'm sure it would, but I would need to sit down and think about how it would. I mean, I don't know it doesn't, to, to tell you the truth. Um, I think, you know, the thing that we were interested in to see whether things happened on the bike, for example, is just because of you'd have rel you have a lot less skeletal muscle damage. Right. Yeah, so I don't think I gave you a very good answer. That's because I can't. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead. So Please. What would be the, um, in practice, that you would hope that in this era of exercise and medicine and um, individuals are seeing their clinicians, their clinicians asking them about their exercise history, they've learned that they've been a heavy endurance athlete for a long period of time, and now they're... Um, <laughs> I, couldn't hear, I couldn't hear that. I mean, that's unimportant. Okay, because remember, I'm supposed to make the jokes. I'm the speaker. What would be the message to that individual about any sort of behavior modification, or you know, what would they? So I don't think we're at that stage. I don't think we're at the stage to tell people necessarily what to do. I don't go around telling people that are competitive athletes to do less because they're going to get coronary artery calcification and stuff like that. I don't do that. Um, so I think this is, just as I presented it, I think it's interesting. What can we use from this to understand cardiac physiology? What can we use from this to understand coronary artery calcification, atrial fibrillation, and the rest? But I don't think we're at the point to, um, to necessarily alter people's. And the other thing is, you know, knowing this, my only regret is that I didn't train harder and was better, and Tony couldn't go by me. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any regrets of having done that. I think this is scientifically interesting. Now, clinically, I use it all the time when some person is ready to go out the seventh floor window because they've been told that their coronary artery calcification score is over 1,000. And a lot of doctors will tell them, look, you're going to die. You know, you get coronary artery disease and stuff like that. And we basically calm them down by saying, I have a lot of patients from around the country who have values much higher than yours. They're doing fine. We don't know exactly what this means. I do treat them very aggressively for their risk factors, right? Because I do think it's atherosclerosis. So I treat them with statins and azetamide and what other agents I have to use. But that's, that's the clinical implication at the present time. So the clinical implication is really more reassuring those that have it. Now, the clinical implications for people with atrial fibrillation is, um, you know, explaining to them that it may be related to their endurance exercise and, you know, treat the atrial fibrillation. Please. I don't want to get in the way here, but I was going to take a shot at this. I, um, you did a beautiful job of uh, telling us what we know and what we don't know. And... Uh, I'm a clinician myself. The way I handle it is this. Uh, you tell people what we know, which is that moderate exercise is helpful in terms of if you're looking for longevity. It depends on what your goal is. But some people do have the misconception that doing a whole lot more is going to make them live longer and be more healthy. If your goal is to compete or to enjoy that, that high you get by doing really long endurance work, then you're, you're fine. We can't tell you that it's going to make you live longer or have less events. That, that's how I address that. And I think your data that you showed well, it's, pretty much supports It's exactly the way I sort of do it. I mean, but, I mean, I don't discourage people from exercising. 
because of this data at the present time? No, no. But it is true that there are people that have the misconception that by running for four hours or doing a triathlete, triathlon, they're, they're in getting healthier. Yeah, and so... And, and I don't think we have the data to say that. Maybe, maybe not. I think, I think that's, that's, that's fair. Uh, you had a question. You had a question. Uh, so going there, the, one of the biggest increases in endurance sports right now is the 50Ks and 100Ks and those people who are out there four to eight hours. So can you speculate on... So the marathon is, can be two to four hours of hard trying to run to fatigue while the 50Ks are a different piece of their own. Do you think that might be something yes, that I, I, longer? Yes, I do think it may have an effect um, because... Um, on all, if you look at studies, so there are these studies that show this little bit of increase, non-statistically significant, at the far, far end out here. They almost never involve moderate exercise. So in all the moderate exercise studies, there doesn't seem to be an increase. Now, one of the reasons for that is that it's hard to get that many calories expended from moderate exercise. You have to do a lot of more intense work to get the higher value. So, I mean, I don't, I can only speculate. I don't, I think... I don't know. At the present time, we don't know. And you know, when I, that comment I made about the, the triathletes and the cyclists, I mean, they're working pretty hard during those training exercises, so they're not necessarily going easy. Whereas if you run, you know, um, you know a 50 km race or whatever, uh, you know, you can't, you can't do it hard. Most people can't do it real hard the yeah. whole way. But no, we don't know. Please. So after that 140-mile uh, race across the United States, uh, they measured uh, factors associated with heart disease and stuff one week after what happens no no day, the day after oh the day after yeah, they, what they happens did like over time Does the, do those like go down so increase? what they measured primarily was they measured coronary artery um, plaque using computerized tom tomographic angiography and they would I do not know that it was repeated all, all I've got is the publication as it came out but I don't know what happened long term now, our suspicion is that once you put down atherosclerosis, soft plaque, you will ultimately turn that into hard plaque unless you rupture it. Please. Please. Well, runners tend to compete at a large range of distances. You have your 5K competitors, 10K, 15, you know, up to the marathons. You are kind of concentrated on the marathon range, which is a really small proportion. Where do you, do you see this propagating downward to lower distances? Are those people safe? Kind of where would that dividing line be? Any sense of that? So we don't know the answer as to where that dividing line is. And again, it's the, what I refer to as the Big Bang Theory. When we started looking at how exercise affected lipids, we first started doing measuring before and after marathons, right? Because you get a big bang, you expend a lot of calories. So that, that's the sort of work that needs to be done, whether there's, there's a difference between the type of activity, whether there's a difference between the, um, uh, you know, the, just the, the, the length of the activity. I, we don't have all that sort of stuff nailed down. So what I'm trying to present to you is a, an idea of concept. And then there's a lot more that needs to be done to flesh this out to see if it's real, to see if it has bad import, et cetera. Please. Has there been any studies that have looked into the... I'm, hard, I'm not deaf. My wife has had my hearing check, <laughs> but I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, is there any studies that have looked into uh, sort of the longitudinal effect of so, sort of these more extreme endurance activities on the calcification of uh, some of the arteries around the heart? Just because it's we're comparing... Uh, a lot of the studies you've talked about is looking at this after one event, but we don't necessarily know the background of training leading up to that, so that could vary a lot between individuals. Right. No, we don't have all that data, but what we're looking at in terms of the coronary artery calcification is not necessarily after one event. Sure. That's people, that's just cross-sectional, people who have been Olympians and kept it up, people that have been slugs and kept it up. You know, so that's... Um, Things. So, no, there's not a lot of stuff on that that I know of. Well, please, for those that are interested, please stay on. Paul's quite willing to stay and, and take on uh, more questions. But I do want to thank you very much give, uh, for this insightful and uh, 
informative and also entertaining yeah. They didn't laugh very hard at any of those jokes. <laughs> Internal. <laughs> <laughs> really, folks, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for having us.